Well, we've been studying Daniel chapter 9. Clearly, in my mind, one of the most fantastic chapters in the Bible. Climaxing, of course, in the last four verses, which constitute the fabled 70-week prophecy, where the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and gives him a precise technical prophecy that is perhaps one of the most amazing demonstrations of the deity of Jesus Christ. And uh, in our previous session, we got together, we reviewed that prophecy, but just by way of refreshing our memory, consists essentially of four verses. The dramatic thing about this, to keep in mind, of course, is that this was part of the Old Testament, and thus it was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born, and yet portrays the precise day, predicts the precise day, that our Lord was to present himself as the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King, which indeed he did on the very day that Gabriel uh, had predicted. The first of the four verses, verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9, is of course the, the scope of the whole prophecy. And uh, you might turn to Daniel 9 and verse 24. Gabriel says to Daniel, Seventy Shabuim, seventy sevens, are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city. Keep that in mind. The focus of this prophecy is Israel. Much confusion exists by many uh, otherwise able scholars by not paying attention to exactly what the scope of this prophecy is. Seventy sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, Daniel. And who are his people? Israel, the Jews, exactly and upon the holy city. To accomplish six things, Gabriel says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. A rather dramatic, embracing uh, scope of the uh, of verses. Now some of those verses, if we analyze them, clearly have been uh, dealt with at the cross, but clearly uh, the full scope of those all six is yet to be fulfilled. This prophecy is still running. This prophecy is yet to be consummated, to be completed. Very key idea. And one of the strange concepts we'll encounter tonight is to recognize that these 77s are not contiguous. That is, they're not necessarily all immediately consecutive with one another. We discover quite explicitly in the prophecy that there is a break, specifically between, ver chapter, uh, uh, between uh, the 69th and 70th week. We spent most of our time last session on verse 25, the second of the four verses, where Gabriel says to Daniel, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the King, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troubled times. And while there are four different uh, decrees in history that would trigger this, it turns out three of the four have to do with the temple, not the city of Jerusalem. One of them uniquely deals with the, with the city of Jerusalem and thus triggers the, uh, 69, the 7 plus 62, that is the 69 weeks of years uh, there portrayed. And I won't, go, I won't review all the calendar things we went through and, and so forth, named, save to say that the very day that the end of those 69 weeks of years occur is the very day that we encounter in Luke chapter 19 when our Lord uh, deliberately arranges to be presented as a king. Up till then, every time they attempted to take him as a king, he said, mine hour has not yet come. Then one day, he not only permits it, he arranges it on the donkey, the day that we celebrate as the triumphal entry. And from Luke 19, it's very, very clear, if you study it carefully, that, that it, he's very specifically permitting himself to be accepted as the Mashiach Nagid. Behold the king that cometh, and so forth. And so that was the day that um, Gabriel had predicted. Now, and again, that was all, that's all by way of quick review. We will get tonight, we'll get to chapter, I mean to verse 27, which deals with the remaining week. We've dealt with 69 up till now. And we shortly will deal with verse 27, which deals with the remaining week of years, uh, the seven years that is known throughout scholastic circles as the 70th week of Daniel. But one of the most important things to notice is verse 
26, which occurs between verse 25 and verse 27. And I'm not being facetious. It's amazing how many people fail to perceive that there is an entire verse detailing a number of events that occur after the close of the 69th week and yet prior to the beginning of the 70th week. And uh, so let's... let's uh, You'll notice in verse 25, the one we looked at last time, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah King, shall be 7 plus 62. And of course, as we, we uh, mentioned last time, there are many reasons that people conjecture. Why 7 plus, why not just 69? Why is it 7 plus 62? The most uh, common view is that the seven weeks of years, the 49, it took 49 years to rebuild the temple. And that's one, one view. Others feel it was the close of the Old Testament. There's several things that all uh, could be construed to uh, account for the seven, but it's not clear. But the seven plus the 62 are, in fact, apparently contiguous. Now, we get to verse 26. It says, after the three score and two weeks. Now, notice we had seven plus 62. After the 62, thus, is equivalent to saying after the 69. Do you follow me? There's seven then 62. And after the 62, the following things happen. After three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And unto the end there shall be, uh, it shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. A lot of trouble. Well, the first question is, is what's going on here? After, see, the three score and two weeks come after the, six, the seven. Seven plus six two with the 69 weeks. And he presents himself as the Mashiach Nagid, according to verse 25. From the decree to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the King, the Mashiach Nagid, shall be a total of 69 weeks of years. Interesting. We're reading in the Old Testament, and here it predicts that then... The Messiah, will, the Hebrew word is karat, to be cut off, meaning to be terminated, to be killed. The term is used to be executed for a capital crime. The word is karat. The Messiah will be executed. What a strange idea. And yet here it is in the Old Testament. A recent book that's been published by uh, Mark Eastman and Chuck Smith called The Search for the Messiah. It should be in your bookstores as we speak. Uh, has uncovered all kinds of rabbinical writings from the Talmud and elsewhere, from the first, from, from the, uh, from about one or two BC, uh, one or two uh, uh, centuries before Christ to several centuries after Christ, that the rabbinical writings of the day predicted these very things. They understood that the Messiah would come twice. They understood that he would be go away and come again. It's amazing. Uh, many people of a Jewish background have not been taught what the rabbi, what the early rabbis didn't teach, did in fact teach. If they'll do their homework, it's amazing what, what the beliefs of the early, those early years were. But in any case, the Messiah is here predicted in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, that he would be executed. But notice it goes on, but not for himself. Now, of course, Isaiah 53 explains for whom he would die for whom he would, be, he would suffer. And who is that for? All of us. And that's... I'm not talking about the epistles of Paul, now I'm talking from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, which is your homework assignment. To amplify uh, this, but not for himself. Then it says, the people of the prince that shall come. Strange way of saying it. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We'll speak more of the prince that shall come in the next verse. But there's going to be a people of a certain prince, Gabriel tells Daniel, that will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. It's interesting that that, of course, happened, as we all, I think, are well aware that in 69 and 70 A.D., over a two-year period, actually, the Roman legions under Titus Vespasian, the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions, laid siege to the city of Jerusalem and slaughtered over a million, some estimates go to a million, 600,000 
inhabitants, men, women, and children, in that bloody, bloody siege. And literally, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. And the sanctuary, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD is a matter of well-documented history. Very strange element of that siege is that the temple fell on the Jewish calendar day of the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av. What makes that provocative is, is that when Nebuchadnezzar, five centuries earlier, six, five centuries, or over five centuries earlier, uh, destroyed the temple, it was on Tisha B'Av, on the 9th of Av. The temple fell twice, each time on the same day on the Jewish calendar. And if there's anything that'll cause you to recognize that there's very little in, in the world that's by coincidence is to study the Jewish calendar in terms of their history. It's amazing how, how that's all so orchestrated. It's interesting how the Babylonian armies in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and the Roman armies in the days of Titus Vespasian were so accommodating as to have the key event occur on that precise day. And of course, I'm being facetious. It's interesting, though, that we have, since the, the, uh, the Jesus presented himself as the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the King, in 32 AD, and this fell, the temple fell, the city fell, in 70 AD, there are at least 38 years between verses 25 and verse 27. Because verse 25 completed when Jesus presented himself as King. Verse 27 hasn't happened yet. And I'll come back to some of those details in a minute. But there's at least 38 years between the two. By our observation, we can note that there have been over 1,900 years in this peculiar interval. Now, this interval may, is one of the most difficult things for the initial student to get used to. It's a strange idea, because we tend to presume that these 77s are contiguous. And this is one of those cases where, if you read the text carefully, it, it is expressly uh, 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 indicated that there is a, an interval between verses, between the 69th and 70th week. Knowing that, as you start reading prophecy, you may be startled to discover that that interval appears implicitly throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament. In fact, it appears 24 times. And if you're a mystic, you can make a lot about the number 24 if you remember the early chapters of the book of Revelation. To give you an example of, of this interval, and it's amazing to me as I study the scripture, Old and New Testament, as you go to get sensitive, to see how often this interval is a principal element of the presentation. You might turn with me to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, it opens, of course, with the temptation of Jesus, but when you get down to verse 16, it's the occasion that our Lord uh, manifests his mandate for his ministry. Verse 16, the Lord came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them who are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Period. And I mark that period for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Verse 20. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, get this, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, this is where he formally opens his ministry in the sense of, uh, you know, the, uh, the obvious announcement. This day, he reads from Isaiah, verses, it turns out he's reading from chapter 61 of Isaiah, first two verses, and then announces after reading it, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now what's instructive for us tonight is let's pop back and take a look at Isaiah chapter 61 where he was reading. And one of the things that I'd like you to put in the back of your mind is as you grow in your understanding of the word, always be alert 
to what's not said or what's missing that can often be very instructive. The Lord read from Isaiah chapter 61 the first two verses. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those uh, who are bound. It sounds similar enough to what we read, recognizing that they're taken from different translations, but they they track pretty well. We get to verse 2. He goes on, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What comes right after the D of the word Lord? A comma, exactly. He didn't read after the comma. What comes after the comma? And the day of vengeance of our God. He stopped at the comma, closed the book, and said, this day is this scripture, fulfill your ears. And boy, am I glad he stopped at the comma. He is indicating that the first two verses of Isaiah were being fulfilled very literally. The question that needs to be asked in the back of our mind is, what about the rest of it? Will it also be fulfilled literally? Yes. But for you and I, that comma has lasted 1,900 years. There are other places this shows up. Uh, let's pop over to um, Revelation, chapter 12. Now, there's 24 of these examples. I'm only going to give you a couple tonight, but to give you the flavor of what I'm talking about. In Revelation, chapter 12, we encounter what is sort of a summary, overview. Uh, uh, there are several of these, obviously, in the book of Revelation, where the narrative literally is paused, and there's an overview presentation. And chapter 12 is one of them. Chapter 12, let's just take a look at the first half a dozen verses. Chapter 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, John says, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, traveling in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. And verse 5, she brought forth the male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Interesting passage, as you, most of you realize, I think, the book of Revelation is essentially in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Scripture. Every Id- idiom used is explained somewhere else in the Scripture. In fact, there's no more overwhelming demonstration of the integrity of these 66 books we call the Bible. 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years, and yet are an integrated message system in which every detail is there by supernatural engineering. But if we look at chapter 12, we see the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And uh, it's amazing how the first, the first question in this uh, chapter is to identify idiomatically what is being referenced here by this woman. And many people, many, uh, you've got some commentaries in the book of Revelation, they will identify this woman as the church. And if it's the church, she is in big trouble because she's pregnant. And Paul tells in Ephesians and elsewhere that uh, the church is presented as the virgin bride of Christ. And if this is the church, she's got some big problems. And the church did not give birth to Christ. Who did? Israel. Exactly right. Now, we're not left to guess here. This uh, terminology is interpreted for you by no one less than Jacob himself in Genesis chapter 37. You may recall that Joseph, as a young boy, had these dreams and kept sharing them with his brothers. And one of these dreams not only offended his brothers, offended his father. Because in this dream, Joseph saw himself as one of a group of... By the way, we're not 12 stars, or 12 groups of stars. I won't get into the technicalities here. But the point is that um, the other 11 and the sun and the moon bowed down to him. And this time, what was referenced in the dream, as, re- as recognized not only by his brothers, but also his father's mother, was that this represented them as a family. And so uh, it may sound strange, but none other than Jacob himself interprets that for you in Genesis 37. But even from the context, you can tell she's giving birth 
to the male child. This is the, the woman here is the, the woman that, whose seed Christ is. That is the seed of the woman. So it's Israel, but in the sense that she begins with Eve. And it's the messianic line all the way through. She being with child cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. Now we have another player introduced in verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now many people have been taught that seven means divine. Not so. Seven means perfect in the sense of being completed. It means complete. Why? Who is this red dragon? Don't guess. Notice verse 9. The great red dragon was cast out, that old serpent called devil and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world, and so forth. So we know who the dragon is in this, in this, uh, in this uh, pageant here. And the t ten, <coughs> ten horns and uh, seven crowns upon his heads will be amplified in the following chapter, 13, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight as we get a chance. It's interesting to see his destiny, verse 4, his, or his, his objective. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Most scholars believe that's an allusion to the angels that fell with him. And did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. One of the things you can do as you study your scripture is to review from Genesis through Revelation the antics and strategy of Satan. And you'll discover that his primary focus is to find a way to thwart the plan of God. And this starts when the, the prophecy is given to Eve that the Redeemer would come from the seed of the woman. His first conniving was to get the seed killed. The Cain and Abel story may be the beginning of this thread. And as the story goes on, we always see, then he, he, know, he knows that the Messiah has to be a kinsman of Adam. So the next thing he attempts to do is contaminate the purity of the genealogies of the human race. And we've got this peculiar stuff that goes on in Genesis 6, which God responds uh, with the flood. And on it goes. And as you watch the narratives in Genesis, you'll always see Satan attempting to thwart God's purpose. As God progressively reveals more insight, that it would be when he calls Abraham, and then it's uh, Isaac, and then Jacob. As God focuses more clearly exactly from whom the Redeemer will come, it allows Satan to more clearly focus his attacks. And we find him uh, using his instruments. Pharaoh of Egypt killing the male children, all the way to Herod in the babes of Bethlehem, always attempting to thwart the messianic promise that God has, has committed to redeem the world. As we go through the uh, David and the royal lines, we constantly find all the children being killed, but one slipped away that, uh, 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 to keep the, the line open, if you will. Satan always plotting, attempting to devour the child as soon as it was born. Now we get to verse 5. She, that is this woman, that is here idiomatically speaking of Israel, brought forth a man-child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That helps us clearly identify exactly who is in view here. Psalm 110, Psalm 2, you can find a lot of places where who is the man-child that is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron? The Lord Jesus Christ, you betcha. Then there's this interesting phrase, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Most of us would immediately presume, with reasonable justification, that what's in view here is the ascension. But I want you to notice what happens in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, and there she hath prepared a place prepared by God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And we'll quickly discover that suddenly here we have in verse 6 the tribulation period in view. There is a strange interval missing between verses 5 and 6. The history of this woman between the time that the man-child is caught up to God in his throne and the, the re-picking up of her narrative as it does for the rest of the chapter which uh, picks it up in the tribulation the time, which Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble we'll be talking more, more, more about that tonight but I want you to notice there's an implicit interval between the two now it's interesting that some of the early church men saw in verse 5 not an a double illusion 
not just an allusion to the ascension, but also an allusion to the catching up of the man-child's body. And what is the title of the church? The body of Christ. And some scholars, able scholars, believe that that's a double reference, that uh, 5 also refers to the rapture. But it's interesting that between verses 5 and 6 there's an interval. And we could go on to Isaiah 54, 7, Hosea 3, verses 4 and 5, Amos chapter 9, between verses 10 and 11, also quoted in Acts 15, Micah 5, for, between verses 2 and 3, Zechariah 9, between verses 9 and 10, and on it goes. The real question is, and this is a key to go beyond just the prophecy, but to give you an understanding that's crucial in these days, is uh, this interval is defined very clearly by the Lord Himself. Let's pop back to Luke 19. We uh, dwelt on that last time because it's the it's the fulfillment of Daniel 9 in in, in part. In in Luke 19 verses 28 through about 40, we have the Lord being provided with this donkey, and he rides the donkey into Jerusalem, and the crowd is, is proclaiming him in verse 38, saying, Blessed be the king who cometh in the name of the Lord. There's the announcement, the formal announcement, quoting Psalm 118, actually. Blessed is the king who cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, when you and I have a danger of missing something, the Pharisees come to our rescue. And in verse 39, they highlight for us that there's something important. He says, they say, Rebuke your disciples. And he answers, I tell you that if they held their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Verse 41, when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. He said, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, an allusion, of course, to the precision of Gabriel's prophecy in Daniel 9. If, you had known, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. In the other account, this is account is in three different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all, all recount this area. We, um, the, uh, uh, one of the other accounts, he says that your house is now left to you desolate. Now one of the questions you have to ask yourself, for how long? Is that forever? Does that mean that they are, these things are hidden from thine eyes, Israel? They're hidden from thine eyes forever? No. Let's pop over to the book of Romans. One of the things I'm trying to highlight for you is the, the, the uh, uh, important fundamental distinction between Israel and the church. The Bible goes to some lengths to keep them quite distinct. There are people promoting the idea that Israel that the church is the new Israel. There is a confusion that emerges by confusing the role, the origin, role, and destiny of Israel uh, and the origin, role, and destiny of the church. They are distinct elements of God's program. And we could talk about many examples of this. There was a big dispute between Paul and uh, many of the, uh, the Jewish believers in the book of Acts for almost 20 years, they had this stress about, does a Gentile have to become a Jew to be saved? This finally climaxes in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. And when you read that carefully, you'll notice there are two questions that are being answered. Not, if, if, does a Gentile have to become a Jew to be saved? We're familiar with that. But there's an implicit question that emerges from that. If a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to be saved, what's to become of Israel? And when James, the brother of our Lord, answers and passes the, you know, summarizes the, the findings of that council, the first question he answers is, what's to become of Israel? And he deals with that by qu quoting Amos 9. But our most definitive statement of Christian doctrine is the book of Romans. Some of Paul's letters are hurried, urgent, practical letters, but there's one letter very carefully designed to be a comprehensive statement of doctrine we call the book of Romans. In this definitive statement, Paul spends three chapters hammering away on the theme that God is not finished with Israel yet. Chapters 9, 10, and 11. In the interest of time tonight, I won't go into detail. I do urge you to read those three chapters, specifically focusing on Paul's central thrust as to what's to become of Israel. And the climax of the three chapters is verse 25 of chapter 11. 
Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened. Blindness in part has happened. When did it start? In Luke 19, when Jesus said, These things are now hidden from thine eyes. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And I circle the word until. Someday I'm going to do a study of just all of the critical untils in the Bible. Every time you see the word until, it's a key milestone. This until that. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a marker. Israel is blinded until an event takes place. What is that event? The, the fullness of the Gentile. Don't confuse that with the times of the Gentiles. That's a term that's used of Gentile dominion. Luke, Luke quotes it and essentially starts in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and goes on. We're talking here about something else. The fullness of the Gentiles. And it's an idiom of the church being complete. God, God is calling out a, a, a people for his name. The, na the term Israel appears 73 times in the New Testament. And it always refers to Jews. Sometimes Jews, the, the Israel collectively, in a couple of places it refers to the believing Jews, but within Israel. The church is different. The church and Israel have different origins. Israel was ordained and called and, and covenanted by God in the Old Testament. You know the story. The church was born at Pentecost. Colossians 1.18, 1 Corinthians 12, Acts 1, of course, and so on. There were three prerequisites to the church being born. The atonement, Matthew 16 makes that clear. The resurrection, of course, Ephesians 1 makes that clear. And the ascension, in Ephesians 4, makes that clear. Spiritual gifts could be given to the church. It's, it's the most precious uh, uh, possession is the spiritual gifts unique to the church. And those are given only after the ascension. Another as aspect of the church is its mystery character. The, the concept of the body described in Ephesians 3. The fact that the Christ indwells every believer. Colossians 1. Paul was a Pharisee. He couldn't he blew his mind to realize the, the benefit you and I have. Church is the bride of Christ from Ephesians 5. And of course the other distinct, unique gift to the church is the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll talk more about that tonight. The church is referred to as the one new man in Ephesians 2. And of course, the church is specifically distinguished from Israel in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. The word Israel is never used of the church. There's one verse that caused a lot of confusion, Galatians 6, 16. And that's because some people have not done their exegesis carefully. They overlook a Greek word chi, which turns out in the structure of that text to make it clear that the Israel of God refers to the believers within Israel, and it's not an idiom of the church, as many people falsely believe. So there's a major heresy floating around the community, the, big, the Christian body, by people who confuse the role of Israel in the church. And, and I'm asking you not to take my word for it, but just to alert yourself to the issue, and as you do your Bible study, be sensitive to it. Now, I have here something. How many know what this is? Okay, we've got three, we got uh, maybe what, 5% chess players here. This is a chess clock. And I always think of this when I think of these issues. A chess clock is designed to, be, to, to, to represent the two players. If I'm a player and I push this down, my opponent's clock is running and mine is stopped. When the other guy makes his move, he, he makes his move and pushes this, that stops his clock, and the other one is running. Do you follow me? So a chess clock is designed to create independent times for the two players. It's a... I always... I, I can't help but visualize, and of course when you... Okay, I always, I always uh, visualize God having stopped his clock in Luke 19. Israel's clock. The clock with respect to Israel apparently appears to have stopped. And the church's clock, so to speak, is ticking. The day will come when the church is full and complete. And when it is, the Father says to the Son, go get them. And the church will be complete. That does not bring the end of everything. Israel has yet to fulfill its destiny as portrayed in detail in the Old and New Testaments. And Israel will be the mechanism through which God will deal with the planet Earth. But it's post-church. Strange idea. Critical idea. 
it's interesting that Daniel 9 makes this uh, very manifest as we get into it. Let's, let's, uh, let's return here now to uh, Daniel 9. We've gone through verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall the Mashiach be cut off, but not for himself. The people, the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with a flood, and to the end wars and desolations are determined. So there's, incidentally, the word for flood there, by the way, uh, uh, can be uh, translated diaspora. So the word flood could mean the outpouring the distribution of Israel throughout the world. But I won't get into the subtleties of the text. Let's just move on. Now we get to verse 27. There is one week of the 70. When Gabriel started this uh, presentation to Daniel, he said there were 70 he was going to talk about. He's talked about 69 of these. He's talked about some events that occur after the 69th but before the 70th. Now we get to the 70th week of Daniel. A very uh, 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 critical passage. And he shall confirm the covenant with the many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Heavy stuff. But let's, first of all, we ha we, the whole thing starts with a pronoun. And he shall confirm the covenant with many. Or the word actually isn't confirmed. The Hebrew implies to be in to enforce the covenant with many, and the uh, the idiom in the Hebrew is the many. It actually means it's an idiom for the nation of Israel. But the real question is: is who is the he? There are people that attempt to make the he the Messiah. That somehow this is Jesus, and somehow that he he uh, uh, enforces a covenant with Israel for a week. And then the middle of the week he. He causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and then it spread and overspreads abomination. You've got all kinds of problems if you take that tack, not the least of which is you're grammatically incorrect. The pronoun he refers to the previously mentioned noun. And what is the previously mentioned noun? The prince that shall come. See, there are two princes involved in this passage. The first is the Messiah the Prince in verse 25, but it actually isn't the Messiah the Prince. The word in the Hebrew is Nagid, the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the King. Many people get confused by that. The Prince that shall come is mentioned in verse 26, because it mentions the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, at this point, we can look back, we know who the people that destroyed the sanctuary were. It was the Roman army under Titus Vespasian. Little background. After the death of Nero, General Galba was recalled to become emperor. But there was a conspiracy against him, and he finally gets assassinated. After Galba, a guy by the name of Ortho was made emperor, but he was unfit, and he ultimately committed suicide. That led to a revolution and instability in the Roman Empire. The general in command of the Roman Israeli uh, expedition was recalled to Rome to restore order and to become emperor, a guy by the name of General Vespasian, the father of Titus Vespasian. Now Titus Vespasian was the son, and he was then put in who was he was the captain. He was made the general that was in charge of the army that was laying siege to Jerusalem. A few days before the assault on Jerusalem, his father uh, the space of the Roman Empire, which makes Titus not only general of the army, but a prince. Kind of interesting. Now, in the historical occasion, Titus, is, you could look at him if you want to as a foreshadowing of the, of the prince that shall come, but the phrase here that Di uh, Gabriel is talking about, bear in mind, Gabriel has the advantage of knowing the whole picture. So he, he refers to the people destroying the city and the sanctuary, the people of the prince that shall come. Well, who is the prince that shall come? The prince that shall come is a title. It's one of 33 titles in the Old Testament of this coming world leader about which the Bible has a lot to say. He has 33 allusions made to him in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. This prince that shall come, and that's, see, that's the reason people look at him as a Roman leader, the forthcoming leader, as a, the, the, what we sometimes use the term Antichrist. 
as a Roman leader because it's the people, it was the people of the prince that shall come to destroy the seething sanctuary. Who destroyed the seething sanctuary? The Roman armies. Now, whether you want to use the term Roman or European or whatever, it's, uh, you could even say just Gentile for that matter. But the point is, is that this prince that shall come is an allusion, of course, to the Antichrist. He shall enforce, not, notice he doesn't sign it. He may not have created it. It may have preceded him. But he enforces a covenant with the many for one week. Now, by the way, there are some scholars that believe the covenant refers to the covenant of God with Israel in Genesis chapter 12. That he enforces the covenant by giving them rights to the land. That's in dispute today. Israel claims the land of Israel by right of Genesis 12 and following. The world in general, the UN in particular, disparages that. They, uh, they, uh, they seem to think that David was the king of the Palestinians. And so the dispute of the land in Israel, of course, is a major political bone in the throat of every major force on the planet Earth right now. But this coming world leader apparently will, in effect, enforce the covenant of uh, Genesis 12 by enforcing Israel's right to exist in the land. Do you have a feeling it's getting close? Kind of interesting. He will enforce the covenant with the many for seven years. One week, the final week, seventh week of Daniel, for seven years. However, in the middle of this week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. What does that mean? That means there was sacrifice and oblation going on in the temple in Jerusalem but he will cause it to cease. I want you to notice several things. The temple has nothing to do with the treaty necessarily. The temple may exist prior to the beginning of this, that seven year period. The temple might be built during the first half of that, temple, that, that uh, seven year period. All we know is that it's in existence and being used by the middle of the week of year, the middle of those weeks of years. But we know from this passage that he will, in the middle of that seven-year period, cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. There is a description of this many places in the Scripture. It's described again and again and again. But let's take the one that Paul gives us in Luke, in um, excuse me, First Thessalonians, chapter two. Excuse me, Second Thessalonians, chapter two. Second Thessalonians, chapter two. In verse 3, it makes reference to two of his titles. I mentioned that he had 33 titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. I might give you some of those. Let's just touch a base on some of that. He's in the, among the 33 in the Old Testament, he's called the bloody and deceitful man in Psalm 5. Uh, he's called the branch of the terrible ones, the chief prince in Ezekiel 38, the crooked serpent in Job 26, the cruel one in Jeremiah 30. Uh, the head of the northern army in Joel 2, the idol shepherd in Zechariah 11, the king of princes, Hosea 8, the little horn of Daniel 7, little horn of Daniel 8, um, the merchant the, uh, with balances of deceit in Hosea 12, the prince that shall come in Daniel 9, uh, and, and on it goes, um, the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3, and others. The wicked one in, in Isaiah 11 and elsewhere. The willful king in Daniel 11 will encounter him there. In the New Testament, he's, uh, we, we use the term Antichrist, probably inappropriately, incidentally, but that's still a label that sticks. The beast of Revelation 11 and also the beast of Revelation 13. Uh, the false prophet of Revelation 13 is the title described. Again, we need to recognize there's really two guys, not one. I'll come back to that. He's the father of the lie in John 8. He's the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians 2. Is the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. One that comes in his own name, the prince of darkness, son of perdition, and on it goes. In here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, two of these titles occur. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. I'm fascinated by that phrase. Paul had the Thessalonians for three weeks from, the, from, from start. And within three weeks, he gave them a whole eschatological background. 
because in both his in both first and second Thessalonians, he reminds them of things he told them when he was with them, which what the first three weeks of their Christian walk. Kind of fun. The point is that is what's happening here in verse 27. And uh, what's interesting is this is a passage that the Lord Himself refers to when three when uh, four of His disciples come to Him privately to ask about a second coming. In Matthew 24, verse 15, he points to the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. This desecration of the temple is a primary milestone. And again, I think I've covered this before, but we'll just summarize it again. There are those that try to make the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. a, a uh, fulfillment of the abomination of desolation that Jesus predicted. The problem with that is, is that it didn't happen then. Titus Vespasian, in fact, was tried very hard to preserve the temple for his own purposes. But the soldiers were on a rampage. And it was uh, put on fire and burned. And so he had to, had to take it apart to get the gold. There wasn't any opportunity to establish the false worship system that the abomina abomination of desolation refers to. And uh, we've covered all that before, I believe, so we'll go on here. The interesting thing is is that for Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 to be fulfilled requires a temple in Jerusalem. And for a good part of 1900 years scholars have argued about whether that's literal or not. Because they couldn't visualize Israel being back in the land, they couldn't visualize if they were back in the land regaining Jerusalem, they could regain Jerusalem, would they ever rebuild the temple? What's fascinating for you and I is that as we speak, there are now about 500 priests in training for service in the temple they're preparing to rebuild. And uh, it's an exciting, exciting time. And that's why each year we try to participate in the temple conference where we get up to date on what, uh, uh, in Jerusalem as to what's going on. And uh, uh, each year it's exciting to see the progress they're making. So, um, now, that leads then, uh, uh, Jesus says that that event in the middle of the week will co bring a time of trouble such as the world had never seen to that day or would ever see again. He calls it the Great Tribulation. He actually is also quoting from Daniel 12, and it's from that, fr from that phrase that Jesus quotes from Daniel that we get the phrase, the Great Tribulation. The Bible says lots about, uh, much about many tribulations, but there is a specific time of trouble. And I want you to notice several things, that this period of trouble is um, uh, not seven years long, it's three and a half years long. In the Old Testament, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. By way of review, the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 69 weeks, the 7 plus 62, from the commandment, essentially verse 25. 24 gave you the scope of the whole thing. Verse 25 had from the command to rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah the King. Verse 26 deals with the interval between the 69th week and the 70th week. The last verse, verse 27, deals with the remaining week, which scholars, of course, call the 70th week of Daniel. What's interesting is the book of Revelation from chapter 6 through chapter 19 is essentially a detailing of what occurs in this peculiar period of time. I want you to notice something, is that the middle of the week is of course three and a half years into the seven year period. That period of time, this period of time, is the most documented period of time in the biblical scriptures. Each half of the week is described several ways. In one place, Daniel 7, you may recall, time times in the dividing of time. Single plus a double, one plus two equals three, and a half. It's referred here in Daniel 27 in the midst of the week, or the half week. In Daniel 12, we'll discover it's going to be specifically mentioned as three and a half years. And in fact, both in a very elliptical way, both Jesus and his brother James make allusions to that three and a half years. The 42 months is another way it's referred to in Revelation chapter 11 and also in Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 11 and also Daniel chapter 12, verse 6, it's referred to as 1260 days. So whether it's the middle of the seven year period, or whether it's three and a half years, or whether it's 1260 days, or whether it's 42 months, I can't think of any other way, unless you want to break it down in hours, minutes, and seconds, 
that the Holy Spirit could underline that he's not talking about a, a, an allegory or a symbolic thing. He's talking about 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, or the middle of a seven year period. I don't know what the Holy Spirit could do more than that to get our attention. Now this is probably a good time to try to clear the air on some nomenclature because it's unfortunate but we all end up using uh, jargon and it's a real turnoff to someone that's not into the into the jargon and yet it's tragic but it happens the first big when you what we're dealing with here theologians will call the field of eschatology that is the study of last things if you study the Bible there's different subjects but one of the subjects we're looking at today that intrinsically is, is would fall in the field of eschatology or end time prophecy if you take people with differing views in this area, one of the first divisions will occur is to whether or not they take the Bible literally. In fact, uh, you can almost determine what view they hold if you understand their presuppositions. Someone that's willing to allegorize the Bible suddenly has, has, has cut his tether from truth or reality because there's no way no way to verify it or check it. Do you follow me? You immediately start getting off in that never never land. Uh, a little background on this that's probably uh, important to mention. Um, there is a doctrine called eminence. Let me just, it, it, well, I better take one thing at a time. Well, there's a doctrine called eminence. That is that the early church, you can demonstrate from the scriptures and also from the writing of the Antonicene fathers before the Council of Nicaea. The writings of them, clearly they were taught in the scripture and believed in their lifetime that Christ could come back at any moment. That's a doctrine called eminence. It was held by the early church and it's a doctrine that if you take the Bible seriously, you hold too. That Jesus could come, there is nothing that need intervene between now and his calling for his church. When Constantine was converted, or I should say when he declared the Roman Empire, uh, the state religion, as Christianity, that was in about 320, he, he issued the Edict of Toleration, as it's called, in AD 325. That made the church the official religion. It was at that time that this premillennial view of, of the Lord's literal return became very unpopular. See, the first def distinction between uh, uh, people of, of uh, between views of the end times has to do whether or not you take the idea of Jesus returning to the earth and assuming the throne of David to rule politically, literally on the earth. Whether you take that literally or not, I think most of us here because of the Old Testament promises that were reconfirmed to Mary by Gabriel at the, in Luke 1, uh, that Jesus would take the throne of David, etc., hold that view. That means we are premillennialists. That is that we literally believe there's a millennium. The Bible talks about a millennium. Revelation 20 speaks of it as being literally a thousand year period, but most of what we know about the millennium comes from the Old Testament, Isaiah 65 and elsewhere. And the first division that occurs among people is whether they take that literally or symbolically or allegorically. The church, from 325 on, began to adopt an allegorical view of that. Why? Because the church was the official position of the Roman Empire, yet it was not popular with the Roman emperors to treat that view of Christ coming back to set up the rule in lieu of Rome, literally. So they began to allegorize it. About the third century, the theologian Oregon started this, and Augustine adopted this amillennial view. It became the official view of the Roman Catholic Church. Under the Protestant Reformation, while the Reformers dealt with many of the critical doctrines by going back to the Scripture, they didn't really attack in detail the eschatology. So many of the early Reformers didn't discern the, the errors and problems with what's what you and I would call an amillennial position. One of the difficulties today is that many of the mainline denominations in this country if you peel the onion and look inside, you'll discover really hold to what's called an amillennial view. They don't take it seriously that Christ is going to come back and rule the earth as, as uh, in lieu of man in, in, in man's attempts. And uh, it's interesting that the literal interpretation was followed by Arrhenius and other early church fathers, and even people like Sir Isaac Newton, the famous scientist, 
uh, wrote papers on the literal view of the scriptures. It's interesting that this business of a gap that I mentioned to you occurs in the Epistle of Barnabas, was written about the first century A.D. in other early writings. There are people that will try to tell you that this whole idea started with a guy by the name of J.M. Darby in 1833. They're actually wrong. He was indebted to uh, Lacunza in 1812, Edward Irving in 1816, Margaret MacDonald in 1830, but it's even earlier than that. See, Arrhenius in his Against Heresies in the first century, the Hippolytus, the disciple of Arrhenius in the second century, uh, in, his, uh, in the Antonicene Fathers, you'll find all this, Justin Martyr in his Dialogue with Trifo. I actually held a book a few uh, weeks ago th through the courtesy of Grant Jeffries that he uh, has uncovered in, uh, in his uh, search by Peter Giroux in 1687 called The Approaching Deliverance of the Church, which exp expresses all these views. Philip Doddridge's commentary on the New Testament in 1738. Dr. John Gill's commentary on the New Testament uh, in 1748. James McKnight's commentary in the uh, apostol uh, apostolical epistles, 1763, and Thomas Scott's commentary on the Holy Bible in 1792. These ideas are not current. These are not contrivances. They are, in fact, the, the, uh, consistent with the early views of the church. Now, getting back to some clarifications that may help. The first distinction is whether people take the Bible literally, which would cause them to recognize that Jesus is committed to return to the earth and rule the earth, literally, in a thousand, for a specific thousand-year period that Revelation details. Once you even accept that, if you're, then you're in the camp of premillennialists, you've got another point of, of, of debate. We have the 70th week of Daniel, and we have some people that believe that the rapture of the church will not occur until the end of the 70th week of Daniel. That is, the rapture of the church. Okay, let's talk about the rapture. I guess I better take one thing at a time here. <laughs> um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, we have the term, uh, 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 the, uh, or 1 Corinthians 15, we have this idea of the church being caught up. The term in the Greek is harpazo. But in the Latin Vulgate, it's ruptural, to be caught up. So the word rapture doesn't occur in the English Bible, it occurs in the Latin Bible, and that's where we get this term rapture to refer to this event that is described by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, I think it's probably uh, not inappropriate to take a quick look at that. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, we all know that. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter. The whole lengthy chapter is about the resurrection in all its forms. We get down to verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And on he goes. The other reference is 1 Thessalonians 4. The last few verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus shall, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. Or really, he says, uh, yeah, okay. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall arise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be harpazo, or rapturo, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so he goes. These two, and there's other references, but these are the, perhaps the two crispest references to the rapture. The question is, there are some that believe that that happens at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. And there's some reasons they believe that, that uh, the, the, there are some ambiguous passages that can be viewed several different ways. People who believe that are called post-tribulation rapture believers. Most post-tribulation rapture believers also are amillennial you'll discover that most people who hold that view have the problem they've got to allegorize other scriptures. Once you start allegorizing the scriptures, you quickly get dismissed the whole idea of the millennium itself. So you'll discover that the classical denominations in general have been amillennial and post-trib. 
There are others that recognize all kinds of passages that indicate that the church will not go into the tribulation. They are called pre-tribulation believers. And pre-tribulation believers are also very typically premillennial, obviously. There are some, a smaller group, that say the tribulation isn't the 70th week of Daniel. The tribulation is actually the last three and a half weeks of the 70th week of Daniel, and they're correct. And they believe the rapture will occur on or prior to the middle of the week, and they're called mid-trib believers. Surprisingly, there's not a lot of difference in other issues between mid-trib and pre-trib people. There are some technicalities. Now, I don't think this is the proper form and time to try to present the pros and cons of each position. <coughs> Let me say candidly that I am none of those. Exactly. Because the first thing you should understand is the distinction between Israel and the church. If you really understand the distinction between Israel and the church, you come to an even more bizarre view. You first of all take very literally the kingdom prophecies of the Old Testament and New Testament with regards to a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You also take seriously the promises that the church will not go through the tribulation. In fact, as you study Daniel 9 and other passages, you come to the conclusion that the church has to be raptured prior to the appearance of the Antichrist. Which means you're not only premillennial, you're not only pre-trib, you are pre-70th week of Daniel by some distance. What do I mean by that? Okay. Again, time doesn't permit us to go to the thorough exegesis of it, but if you study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 carefully, you'll discover that among the many insights there, one of them is, is that there is a hinderer that has to be removed from the earth before the man of sin can be revealed. And if you chase that one down and study it carefully, you'll discover that the only one that fits the Greek text is the Holy Spirit as he indwells the believer. So what Paul is building his argument on in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the concept that the body of Christ is removed from the world as a prerequisite condition before the Antichrist can make his appearance. Now, knowing that, let's review the, let's re the whole situation. The tribulation is the last half of that seven-year period. That 70... Week, that seven year period, the 70th week of Daniel, is defined by a treaty that this coming world leader enforces. Before he can enforce the treaty, he has to be in power to, for, to enforce the treaty. Before he can be in power to enforce the treaty, he has to appear publicly. There is some interval of time between the time he first appears publicly, the first time he's revealed to the public, and he's empowered to to enforce the treaty. That could be one day, it could be 30 years, we have no idea. But before he can be revealed publicly from 2 Thessalonians 2, the church is out of here. Now this is where it gets kind of exciting. Now incidentally, let's talk a little bit more about him. I think we've got time to squeeze in a few other things. The scripture has a lot to say about him, and the notes that accompany, will accompany this tape, you'll have uh, uh, the titles and all, uh, you know, you'll have plenty of places to look. But we know he's going to be an intellectual genius, from Daniel 7, 8, Ezekiel 28, and elsewhere. He will be a persuasive orator, from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. He will be a shrewd political manipulator, Daniel 11. He'll be a very successful commercial genius. From Daniel 8, Revelation 13, Psalm 52, Daniel 11, Ezekiel 28, and elsewhere. He will be also a powerful organizer. He'll be a unifying religious guru, or I should say more closely associated with one. He will also emerge as a forceful, a forceful military leader. He won't be a military leader initially. He'll be a finance man that comes to power by peace making. And then from that power builds his base. And I encourage you to look at Psalm 10, 52, 55, Isaiah 10, 11, 13, and 14, Jeremiah 49 through 51, Zechariah 5, Revelation 18, other words. Now, the other controversy that occurs, is he a Jew or a Gentile? Everybody asks me, is he going to be Jew or Gentile? There's a lot of reasons he might be a Jew, from Ezekiel 21 and the 28, 
Uh, Daniel 11. Also in John 5, Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name, you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Referring to Israel. Israel will receive this guy. As indicated by John 5, 43, and also Psalm 55. And yet, on the other hand, we also know that he's got to be a Gentile. He's the prince, you know, the people of the prince that shall come. He's a Roman or a European leader of some kind. Revelation 13 illuminates this mystery. Because there's not one, there are two of them. If you read Revelation 13 carefully. Some other dimensions. He is going to be, in a sense, the son of Satan. This is Satan's big moment. Genesis 3.15, Isaiah 27.1. Ezekiel 28, Revelation 13. Some people believe that he will be Judas Iscariot he reincarnated. That's a little bizarre. You don't run into that very often. But it's surprising when you get into it. You can build quite a case for that. And I won't derail this discussion by getting into that one. I'll just make you aware of it so in case you run into it. He does emerge out of the Abuso from Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Throughout the years... There have been all kinds of theories. People of you know, the early centuries, they thought it was you know, Nero. There are all kinds of mechanical number crunching that generates that idea. In later years, they thought it was Napoleon. You'll actually find pa technical papers written playing around with the spelling of Napoleon in Latin and all that stuff. There were many, and still float around, that think it's JFK. And let me warn you, if you haven't run into this, you'll get some surprisingly interesting arguments. He's the only guy the whole world knows is dead. It goes back to life. Some thought it was Kissinger at one time, because he used to play around with his names and numbers and the 666. I continually, still, get papers sent to me from various people who will take names and fool around with the alphabet and the numbers to get 666. What they don't seem to understand is the gametria refers to the Greek or the Hebrew, and uh, so on. Juan Carlos is another common uh, conjecture. Some people who have not done their homework thoroughly enough think it's the Pope, but they don't really understand Revelation 13 by saying, or Revelation, the book of Revelation will say that. But let me dismiss all of this very simply. Any Bible-believing Christian that has done their homework knows that he won't be known until we're out of here. It's a total waste of time to get sucked up into these conjectures. What causes that to happen is that most able scholars today believe he's alive today. And that causes you to sort of look around. I don't think it's Rush Limbaugh. So if you wandered in here by accident, you've wandered into a not just a pre-trib, pre-millennial group, but a pre-70th week of Daniel guy up here. And I'm not asking you to accept my views. That's the last thing in the world I want you to do. I do hope that this excursion, this summary, superficial though it is, will stimulate you to get your, do your homework. Realize that the Bible does talk precisely in terms of timing and details of history as God uh, ordains it. And we are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says a great deal. Now one of the things that um, I like to point out is there are a whole series of events on the world scene today that have never happened before in history, and not one, but all of them are coming together. First of all, if you're trying to find out what time it is on God's calendar, you always look at Israel. Israel is back in the land. And Isaiah chapter 11 says when they're back the second time, and that's when they are now. The first time was after Babylon. Now they're regathered the second time. That's it, gang. It isn't the third or fourth. It is now. They are re On May 14th of 1948, the state of Israel is reestablished. And as the Bible said, they'd be in control of biblical Jerusalem. And in June of 67, they regained biblical Jerusalem. The Bible says they'll rebuild their temple, as we've just seen, and they have be, they're, they're preparing to do that in, in earnest. The Bible says that the city of Babylon will reemerge in the banks of the Euphrates, and Saddam Hussein has spent the last 20 years beginning that. I'm not saying it's finished, but it's certainly uh, a, a very re relevant biblical milestone. Jer Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50, 51, and Revelation 17, 18 uh, say a great deal about that. While all this is going on, a European superstate is to emerge, a re-emergence of the old Roman Empire. 
quaint idea, and yet, as we watch, it's happening. It's happening. While all this is going on, one of the things that I believe precede the 70th week, maybe very shortly, maybe substantially, but I believe one of the main events that sets the stage for all these things is the famed Magog invasion, the, the, where Magog and uh, his allies invade the Middle East, invade Israel. And Russia is arming Iran to do that. The, the lead ally in Ezekiel is Iran and, and the others. And it is, uh, the more you study that passage, the more you're aware of what's going on today, it could happen at any moment. And one of the interesting things that occurs on the 1st of January of 1994 is the replacement of the Russian hammer and sickle. The famed hammer and sickle that we're all familiar with as a symbol of, ho uh, of communism is, of course, a symbol of the old Soviet Union, and it is gone. What is interesting is what Russia is replacing it with. You can't imagine. They are replacing it with the famed double eagle of the House of Romanov, of the Tsars. And you will see a, the, the famed double eagle, an eagle with two heads facing east and west, and um, uh, with the three crowns and with uh, the orb and scepter. Uh, that was the classic uh, uh, symbol of the Tsars prior to the, re the, the Bolshevik re Revolution. And in the middle, there's a, a shield with uh, St. George and the dragon, uh, uh, a rider on a white horse, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> um, so it's kind of interesting. Now, what's interesting about each of these events, it's not one of them, it's all of them. Israel, the temple, Babylon, Europe, Russia, they're all coming together, and they all impact the seventh week of Daniel. And if my understanding of the scripture is correct, that the church is out of here before the seventh week of Daniel can begin. As I, often, as I often say to groups, when you see all the stores starting to decorate for Christmas, you know that Thanksgiving is near at hand. You see, it's coming close. I've often told you that there are three things God can't do. You're supposed to gasp in horror, right? Every good conservative biblical group, God can't do something? Yes. Number one, he can't lie, right? Eternal one cannot lie eight times in the Tanakh. Second thing he can't do is he can't learn. He knows everything, right? That's very encouraging. That means he can't be disappointed in you. No matter how f fast you fall on your face, he's not. So you may be surprised, he's not. And he's anticipated all of that. He's anticipated all our needs. There's a third thing God can't do, and he, can't, he cannot force you to love him. You've probably heard me say that before. I've got something new. You know there's four things that God doesn't know? supposed to gasp. You're supposed to gasp. You want to listen. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Four things God does not know. Number one, he does not know of a sin he doesn't hate. By that? You done your work? He doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love. Third thing, he does not know a path to his throne other than by his son, Jesus Christ. And there's a fourth thing. He doesn't know of a better time than right now than to receive his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is there anything preventing you from receiving the Lord Jesus Christ right now? Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we were staggered as we perceive the precision with which you have revealed to us that which you are about to do. We're also amazed at the precision of your caring for each of us. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen to illuminate to us the very times in which we live. And Father, if there's any among us that have not yet received the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, Father, you'd give them no peace until they rest in him. We thank you, Father, that you've done the whole job, that there's nothing we can bring to the table but ourselves, our willingness to receive what you have done. 
So indeed, Father, we come before you without one plea other than the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. But Father, we also come with a special petition that you would, through your Holy Spirit, increase in each of us an appetite, a hunger for your word that we might each grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit you would draw us specifically into those portions of Scripture that would have us discover what you would have of us in response. We thank you, Father, for the times in which we live. We thank you for the excitement of the adventure ahead. But we also pray, Father, that you would help us each to understand how we can be participants and not spectators only in this grand adventure as it unfolds. We ask all these things, Father, that we might be more responsive to your will in our lives and be more pleasing in thy sight. For we come before your throne, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, our Mashiach Nagid, our reigning King our Redeemer, our Provider, our Lord and our Savior.